Let me take just a few minutes to introduce our guest speaker tonight. We'll then give the podium and the time over to him. Uh, I finally had the opportunity tonight to meet Brother Brad Harris for the first time. But it's not the first time that I've been aware of him. As I've talked about over the last oh, year or more, uh, one time wandering through Desert Book, I came across the small book, Trails of Testimony, Bringing Young Men to Christ Through Scouting. And I picked that up. Uh, not knowing anything about the author, not knowing anything about the content, but felt inspired that here was something that might help me in what I'm trying to do. And so I picked it up and read it and was very impressed with it. Then later on, as, going, as I was going through trying to work on our assignments for round table venturing, I came across material on the web with Brad Harris as being one of the authors or co-authors. I said, this Brad Harris is a good guy. <laughs> and then I found out that he was a professor down at BYU. Uh, I researched and found a, an email address and uh, contacted him and said, I thought this is going to be a Hail Mary shot, shot uh, long shot. Uh, would he be interested in coming and talking to our, our venture roundtable? And he replied back and went, sure. And uh, I was ecstatic. He, she, I'm glad he couldn't see me dance as a computer monitor. So I came back and we exchanged several emails and set up this evening. So I'm very grateful that uh, Brad would make the time to come join us tonight, Scott. So let me just go through his biography, just so that you have an idea of, of his background. <coughs> Eagle Scout, uh, graduated from BYU with a degree in Youth Agency Administration, uh, since then a Master of Public Administration from BYU. Worked professionally with the BSA for 22 years in Corvallis, Oregon, Berkeley, California, Denver, Colorado, and Dallas, Texas. Uh, where he served as the Associate Director of the Venturing Division in the BSA National Office for five years. Um, as I understand that you were involved with the inception of the, the kickoff and the formation of Venturing. That was in the late 90s, as I recall. In 2003, he accepted a job offer from BYU and moved to Utah. Brother uh, Harris is a full professor there. He is the coordinator of the nonprofit management minor of the Marriott School of Management. And he also worked with the rec uh, recreation management department as well as I recall. He served in the church as a varsity coach, venturing crew advisor, high council, bishop member, bishop, as counselor in the state presidency, and as a member of the Young Men's General Board. He currently serves as the Young Men's President in his ward. Uh, he's the author of the Venturing Leadership Skills Course, the Venturing Roundtable Guide, Venturing Leaders with their Training, and most importantly, well, most recently, and for me importantly, Trails to Testimony, Training Young Men to Christ Through Scouting. Uh, with that, which uh, Wolf, Hope Patrol, and with that, and has served on Woodbatch staff and has taught at uh, Philmont. Uh, and he serves on the Utah National Parks Council of Vector Board. And he lives in Clinton. So, without further ado, let me turn the title over to the brother. Thanks for the invitation. Um, this is great. I'm looking forward to this. I was thinking about venturing here just I came in. I don't get specific venturing requests much anymore. It's usually general church stuff. So I had to hold up on some things. But I was thinking back when I worked at the national office and they would invite me to come to all these different places. I was the guy over all the, all the churches. So there's this Mormon bishop living in Texas. And they wanted me to go out and preach to the Baptists and the Methodists and everybody else about why they should have venturing. So I remember one particular time I was in uh, North Carolina at a beautiful location. And there's a room about this size with probably 80 people of Baptist scouters from all over the country. In fact, it was the National Association of Baptists for Scouters. And I was supposed to be their keynote speaker. But I got there a little early and I was watching them preach. And the person would stand up and he would beat the pulpit and raise their voice. And somebody would say, you know, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And this was, and it was really cool. And I'd seen it before on my mission, but it had been a while. And I'd been traveling a lot. <coughs> And so I thought, I need to try that. You know, I'm, I'm here with the Baptists, and, and State Fred is not here to tell me this is something I should do. So I think I'm with it. It's just demonstrative, right? So I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I stood up and I started, I started quoting 35, 13, 33. It's the same as Matthew 6, 33. You know, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be. And I hit the pulpit, and somebody said, Hallelujah! He said, Praise the Lord! It was great! And so it, it got me all pumped up and I was all excited. And so two days later, I'm back home and I was conducting Saturday. <laughs> and I had this strange thought. I sent him a call to try to get a hallelujah, but you know, I, 
<laughs> We're just different as Mormons. So don't even try that. But <laughs> tonight, in the 50 minutes or so we're together, that you have some silent hallelujahs. And I've learned from people when I was in the state presidency, we've had visiting authorities, they would tell us, you know, write something down. And none of us are really good at remembering everything. We might pick up one or two things, but if something really hits you, write it down. It could be a life-saving thing. It could make a difference in the lives of boys. I mean, what you mentioned here, I'll mention later, uh, Steve, right? About the surveys. It, it's a little simple tool that, if done properly, can invite people to come to, to, to church and the Spirit will hit them and they can be totally different. And then Sunday, they drop the bomb totally, right? Poor Elder Cook. Anybody remember what Elder Cook said? Yeah. Good. I did, I, I, and I apologize. He was, he was grateful that Elder Holland was the first 19-year-old at that time to come into his mission. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, but I wasn't at the uh, session, but I was watching it with my 19-year-old daughter. And when they announced that they were going to lower the age to 18 and the girls to 19, I texted all 10 of my priests and, and my five elders who've just been ordained elders said, what do you think? And by the time Elder Cook was done, I had responses from like seven of them. And I felt bad. Here I was taking time out of Elder Cook's talk, but how has this changed venturing? To me, just I've been thinking about this a lot, venturing is now the missionary training program for the church. Right? So my 17-year-old, this is a very real scenario, what I'm going to tell you. I'm not making this up. A young man will put their mission papers in February of their senior year. Okay? Get the mission call in March. They're still a senior in high school, still a, still a priest, still going to seminary. Have their mission call. Walking through the high school halls with a mission call. Okay? They graduate from high school. They've done all the, all the paraphernalia on Saturday. Sunday, they're ordained an elder. And Wednesday, they're in the MTC. That can happen. That will happen. That's a little scary to think about. But now the boys suddenly, their lives have been fast forwarded for a year. Now again, reminded, they don't have to go when they're 18. It's now they're eligible when they're 18. But I'm telling you, at BYU in the last three days, uh, especially among the sisters, I don't know what we're going to do for the freshman class next year. Now, one of the girls in my class uh, said her dad works for the statistics department of the church and has been working on this for three months and, you know, very quiet about it. And he predicts that by December of next year, we'll have 90,000 missionaries. <coughs> Think about that. Nine, from 58 to 90. All these, all these young women are taken off on missions. Uh, one of my priests, who's already our day dollar, turns 19 in February. He says, I'm not going to go back to Utah State in the winter semester. I'm going on a mission. Uh, so here we are with the young men ages 16 to 18. They go on a mission right at the end of the priest one. No longer are we going to send them off to this scary thing called the YSA, which is a great program, but many young men drift and fall away from the... From the, from the See, the sacred stuff that we had in, in our priest quorum, we're not going to have it anymore. But there's some other problems we're going to envision. I'll, I'll, I'll address those later. Let me start off with this. Take this down. That was kind of <coughs> Why we're here tonight. Okay, so what do these acronyms mean? Bring young men to Christ so they will make and keep sacred covenants. That's why we're here tonight. Uh, Bain Powell, the founder of Scouting, said the reason I organized Scouting was to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. The reason we have Scouting is to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. And he also said, don't let the technical outweigh the moral. So tonight, for the first 20 or 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about the moral. I think without the moral, it's all, it's all technical. And we get bogged down in the techniques. And then, then we're going to talk about some techniques. And I, I was here hearing your, your comments earlier about wanting to get some, some tidbits to help you be a better <coughs> food advisor. We'll talk about that. And you have, a, you have a great one there. So here's the situation. And this has changed since Sunday. I mean, the, the ordinance had happened, but the way in which we do it. These are the five... Ordinances of salvation. Okay? 
And here we have the Aaronic Priesthood, ages 12 to 18, the Baptism, Confirmation, Melchizedek Priesthood, Endowment, and Sealing. And here we have the mission, which is here, but suddenly it's like it's all been condensed. So this is the preparatory priesthood. Let me give you some quotes. When I served on the board, I had the great privilege of working with President Dahlquist, who doesn't live far from here, by the way, just across 92nd. Yeah. Working with President Dahlquist was the uh, was the treat. I mean, I just got to say that every Tuesday night for three hours in the church office building, couldn't wait to go hang out with President Dahlquist, and we would we would sit there and they would they would tell us a day in advance, Elder Oaks is coming, or Elder Packer's coming. So we did there early and clean up on the table, and so we had these private audiences with the apostles, and when they would get done talking to us, we would say, can we share? to the general population what you guys said tonight. And they would either say yes, well, usually be yes, sometimes no. So I just keep track of all the little yeses. So I'm just going to share with you three things. Nothing here is earth shattering, but coming from prophets and apostles, I think it's important what we're talking about. Uh, the priest and executive council, this was with Elder Oaks, Elder Holland, and Elder Bednar. They said there's three issues facing the church. Number one, building faith in and testimony of Jesus Christ. First issue facing the worldwide church, building faith in and testimony of Jesus Christ. Number two is to retain and reclaim the Lord's lands. Retain the boys that are coming and reclaim those that aren't. And the third issue facing the church is the growing, excuse me, the uh, strengthening the rising generation. And then they stop and they, they talk about the rising generation. Boys ages 8 to 30 and girls ages 8 to 30. Very concerned about that. They talk about the young single adults, probably their biggest concern. And, and we have we have changed that in the last five days. But still, the brother, this hasn't changed. Building faith in the testimony of Christ, retaining and reclaiming the Lord's land, and strengthening the rising generation. At a separate meeting with just Elder Bednar, with all of the auxiliary presidencies in the Relief Society office, he said there's Two things, two questions we should ask when we do any activity with young men or young women. And he says it's a lens. It's a lens you, you should look through. A criteria that we should look at. Anytime we organize any event, we should ask two questions. Number one, what's going to happen in this event that's going to build faith in Christ? See how the, the theme here? We're talking about Christ in three different ways. How can we build faith in Christ? And how can we strengthen the family? And he says if you can't figure out how you're going to build faith in Christ, strengthen the family, and an activity, you should build the activity. Now that doesn't mean we, we have firesides and talks all the time. You can do great things on mutual nights and in the outdoors that will build young men, bring them closer to Christ, and strengthen their family. So this, he says it's a lens we should use as a rule for everything we do. And then a third issue, Elder Holland asked the question one night, what's the biggest problem facing the church right now? And, and he answered it. It's the growing pool of prospective elders. Again, it's that people who turn 19, 20, 21, 22, they're still priests. The growing pool of prospective elders. He was referring to a talk by President Monson earlier. Here's this growing pool of prospective elders. They don't make it to, to the Melchizedek priesthood. They're down here in prospective elder land. And that pool is growing. He talked about the analogy that President Monson said was a creek flowing in, and it's overflowing instead of going into the Melchizedek Priesthood. So, what's happened in the last week is we have sped up this process. There's no longer this downtime or this, this uh, just, where we're just kind of floating. We're going to go straight from the right Priesthood into the Melchizedek Priesthood, the endowment, and then the ceiling, of course, after the mission. There's going to be some scary situations on the missions. I mean, I can see them. The boys who are homesick are going to come home early. And we'll talk about that here in a moment, too. But I love what happened on Sunday. It, it puts extreme pressure on us, more so than we had before. We can't look at the priest corner as just the last step of the only priest. We look at it as the first step towards the Melchizedek priest. It's the new, it, it is a missionary training center. I don't know how else to put it. I texted my assistant advisors, and we haven't even seen the boys yet, other than you know, mutual night, but we're going to change what we do on Sunday. 
So we do the lessons, but we have, we have to really push forward to do some different things to achieve what we want to do. Okay, here's some other quick statistics that will help recognize this. <coughs> so this is from the United States and Canada. This is 13-year-old boys on the records of the church. All the boys records of the church. 15, 17, and 20. We started at age 8 with 100% of the boys. At age 13, we give them a year to be ordained a deacon. So at age 13, in the United States and Canada, 79% of the boys are ordained deacons. At age 15, of the same 100, 70% of the boys are ordained teachers on time, within a year of when they're supposed to be. At age 17, 64% of the boys are ordained priests. And at age 20, 41% of the boys are ordained elders. You can see the, the drop. Doesn't mean that it happened here, but this is where it manifests. Because elder, young men can know elder with missionary. And that, that's a big commitment. I think uh, about 38% is our current percent of boys, United States and Canada, that are serving missions. So it's almost the same. Very few boys are 20 years old, they're elders if they're not missionaries. Okay? Uh, speaking of missionaries, just a couple more things here. Elder Perry visited us one night. At the time, he was the, he was the chair of the missionary department for the church. And he, this was back in 1997, or 2007, when he saw us. Now, these numbers have changed a little bit. He said, in 1997, there was 52,400 male missionaries serving in the church. In 2007, 41,000. And that's something you can hear at General Conference. 20% uh, decline in the missionary force, the male missionary force, in 10 years. And during the year 1997, 4% of the boys came home early for other than health reasons. Uh, unrepentant sin or weren't ready or homesick or whatever. In 2007, 7%. So we were in this boardroom on the 20th floor of the church office building. Elder Perry, a very imposing figure, not scary, but just kind of imposing, was beating the pulpit and telling Charlie, he's calling, he calls prison dog with Charlie, what are you doing about this, he says. And we're all kind of hunkered down, waiting for Charlie to answer, right? And of course, he's quick on his feet, and he said something really cool, you know. But then we talk about what can, what's, what's the cause of this, and even more important, what's the cause of this? Well, the, the birth rate is down, for one thing, not 20%, but that's, there's fewer boys that could be missionaries than there was in 97. But we, the uh, Raise the Bar came out, I think, in 2001. But there's been confusion about that. We haven't included or added any new requirements to serve a mission. We're simply enforcing those requirements better. So that has, that has made some boys who would go on mission otherwise would. But we talked about the gadgetry. We talked about the world. We talked about the lack of preparation for young men. And right here is where it shows it. They get out of the mission and they're coming home almost twice as fast as they were before. Now, fortunately, I don't have the raw numbers, but this this has tapered off in the last few years. And then when, El when President Monson announced two years ago, reiterated going on a mission, I think they announced in conference this has gone up 6% in three years. So 2% a year. And of course, with the announcement Sunday, it's, it's just going to take off. We'll have more missionaries. Uh, we want more missionaries even if they're 18. And that's kind of scary. 17-year-old uh, boys preparing for admission as if they're 18, and still in high school. Um, how's that going to work with dating? Yeah. A boy has a mission call in high school, right? Does he hold his girlfriend's hand down the hall with a mission call? I don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of things we have to worry about here. It, it just opens up. And then the funny, the President uh, Samuelson didn't know about it. You know, the president of BYU, they built all these freshman dorms like a year ago, and brand new dorms. We're wondering, who are they going to put in there? <laughs> the girls. And the girls are going to be gone, too. So it's going to be interesting to see what's going Okay, a couple of other real quick statistics. Um, they surveyed 38-year-old men. This is the importance of the mission. So this is 38-year-old men, return missionaries, and no mission. First question, were you sealed in the temple? 92% of this audience 
Return missionaries said at age 38, by the time they're 30, they've been, they've been sealed in the temple. 38% of those who hadn't gone on a mission were sealed in the temple by age 38. Do you hold the temple recommend? 76, 21. I mean, if this was, a, what was an election, what would we call this? Historical uh, I mean, this landslide. Show up, right? A landslide. If you were from Mars and didn't know what a mission was, you saw the imprint of actions making and keeping sacred covenants, you would have to conclude something happened on this experience that helped them make those covenants and keep the covenants. More importantly, keeping the covenants. So we know the importance and the effect of a mission on our young men. One last statistic. Or quick note. When we was when we were working with President Dahlquist, we would visit the MTC, two or three of us every week, to train the senior couples. And one week we were there, President Dahlquist talked with the mission president and said, you know, it's just a casual conversation, what, what can we do to imprint or brand our young men to make them more successful on their missions? If you could, if you could fantasize and brand or inject in every young man something, what would it be that would be a better guarantee of success to reduce this 7%? <clears throat> And that without hesitation, the mission president said two things. A significant away from home experience before their mission. That's what bugs me about the 18 year old figure. Okay? Uh, and secondly, work ethic. They have, I mean, this is really, to, this is really the parents. They, the boy should know how to work and work hard before he goes to the MTC because he's going to work hard. And the, and the culture shock is so big, they can't handle it sometimes. And a significant away from home experience before their mission. So, some parents, knowing that, will say, go off to your freshman year and spend a semester away from home, and then go on your mission, versus, you know, 18. Uh, some boys are ready to go no matter what, but those two things, I think we should send a note to our parents and a note to ourselves of how we can prepare these young men. And then ask the question, can scouting help or assist parents with those two things? No question. Uh, two of my boys went to the National Jamboree for my first time. They'd never been away from home, really, other than scout camp. They're away from home for three weeks. They saw people from different cultures, the East Coast, okay? <laughs> which is very different from Utah. Uh, they spent two hours of private time in the uh, sacred grove. And I'm telling you, Matt Cox came back as a different kid. Uh, he had his significant away from home experience, just going to the Jamboree. He's, he's more prepared for a mission now than beforehand. A scouting camp out, 11 days in West Virginia, prepared him for a mission. Now, what do they call uh, NYLT here? Do they call it NYLT or do they give it a name? Not NYLT. It's called NYT. In our council, and in the Utah and Sparks Council, it's called Timberland. <coughs> Same thing here. That, that is the number one thing that has got our parents on board for scouting is watching their kids go to Timberland. They come home from Timberline for a week. They've learned to be leaders. They're away from home. They're learning leadership skills. It's essentially wood batch for boys. They come back. And they're able to lead. And then they're able to lead in the deacon's corner. And then they're able to lead in the mission field. It's probably the best missionary training thing I think we have. Is a scouting one week at a camp away from home. Okay. Let's talk about scouting. Remember this. Again, I'll use an acronym. <coughs> the aims of scouting. What are the aims of scouting? CCF. Citizenship. Character and fitness. Those three things. And by fitness, physical fitness, spiritual fitness, mental fitness, social fitness, character, citizenship. When I think of citizenship, I think of Captain Moroni, right? I think of character, I think of Nephi, who had to even overcome the grumblings of his father to continue and go, for, and go get a new bow. When I think of fitness, I think of Daniel. I mean, if we were to have a super troop, from the scriptures. Oh, they'd be my secret patrol leader and two patrol leaders right there. These three things are all over the scriptures. We, just like Elder Bednar's two questions, which we should use as a, as a guide, what are we doing to build faith in Christ? And what are we doing to strengthen the family? We should say, what's going to happen on this camp out that's going to build character and citizenship and fitness? It's not just another night for the camping merit badge. That's one reason, but that's the lowest reason. So many more noble and moral things that we want to accomplish in scouting, if properly applied. We've developed some bad habits. 
in the church when it comes to scouting. We have way too much emphasis on advancement. We, we want boys to earn their ego, but there's lots of other things that we can do to make it happen. But let me illustrate this with the methods or the strategies. And I didn't, I didn't make these up. I just put them in a way that makes it easy for me to tell, talk about. The strategies are designed to achieve the aims, and I've given them uh, acronyms. So here's Cubs, Scouts, Varsity, and Venture. And after I do this, we'll spend the rest of the night on venture. Okay. So, cups. These are the. This is an acronym. Should I just take this down? Is that this is scouts, which is all soap. This is Dan A. Cuffed. This is Saul Soap. And this is Al. Al. Right. Okay, I'm going to go through these real quick. This is the Den. These are specific things that are already overlaid in the program for the last hundred years to achieve those aims. The Den, advancement. Neighborhood centered activities have a new thing called character connection. In all the books, it says this will help build character. Character connections. Uniform, family oriented, and the T is the ideals. By the ideals, we mean the Scout Oath, the, the Cub Scout Oath, the Cub Scout Model, the Cub Scout Sign, Salute, so on. So for Boy Scouts, the P is the patrol method. Baden Powell, the founder, said, if you're not using the patrol method, it's not true. It's not Scout that I envision it. It's just some other youth program that you think is Boy Scouts. And when you go to Wood Badge, that's what you learn. Without the patrol method, it's really not unique. This is advancement. Uniform, we add leadership. <clears throat> the S is scouting ideals. And by that we mean the oath, the law, the motto, and the slogan. This is the outdoors. This is adult association, which is essentially the merit badge program, as it was originally designed. We kind of got off track with that with powwows and classroom stuff. Uh, looking back at my life, quick story, my scoutmaster must have had it figured out. I was 12 years old. I wanted to earn the athletic merit badge. Some of you may remember that. It was purple with a yellow foot with flames on it. It wasn't even required, but I wanted that badge and I liked the way it looked. And I was going, I was getting into sports and so. My scoutmaster gave me a blue card. I went and I said, I gave him a blue card. He signed it. Okay, he says, I have permission to do the ethnic merit badge. And he gave me the name of a merit badge challenge. Now, back then, you could do one on one. I called, the hardest thing for me to do was to get up the courage to call the merit badge challenge, which my mom <coughs> made sure I did you know, after three or four nights. I called Dean Dixon, who happened to be in my ward. This was in Oregon. And I knew Dean Dixon just a little bit, but I didn't know much about him. And the scary part was calling on the phone, I made an appointment. My mom dropped me off at Dean Dixon's house. Now today, you can drop off two boys, make sure somebody else was there. I still do this. And I met with him four times, like every Tuesday afternoon for four weeks. I had my merit badge counselor book with me, and we worked on different things each week. After four weeks, he signed them all off. I brought the blue card back to my scoutmaster, and at the troop meeting, I got my badge. Not at the court of honor, the troop meeting. That hasn't changed. That's still in the book. Okay. Uh, but more important than that technical stuff is what happened during those four visits with Dean Dixon. Oh my goodness, Dean Dixon was a man of God. I didn't know this. My, my father had not served a mission. He was in Okinawa at age 18, you know, going like this. Dean Dixon had served a mission. He had this fire in his belly that I had never seen before in a man. And after four weeks of hanging out with him, this little fire was started. My brother was just going on a mission, and that double thing really hit hard. 
That's the purpose of the Ameripass program, is to introduce young men to men and women of character that they can double, triple, or quadruple what their parents do. Or maybe they don't have parents that are good role models. This can, this can put them with good role models. That's what the Merit Badge program should be. Personal growth is the Scoutmaster Conference at each level of advancement and service. That's the Paul Soap. Now, varsity, we call it a squad instead of a patrol. The rest of these are the same, but don't be deceived thinking varsity is just a knockoff of Boy Scouts, or it's just Boy Scouts on steroids, or just another program for 14 year olds. We have the program managers, we have the consultants. Every young man should have a position in a varsity team, and every boy is a leader. We have some different uh, advancements, some different recognition, and it should be a step up from what we do in the deacons. We get to venturing. This is our priest corn, adult association. This is critical. Many boys at this age are starting to break away from their parents in, in a natural way. They need to have some other adults to look at. This is leadership. I've got a, a model that I use with my priest corn. It's hard. Never do for a young man what he can do for himself. Think about it. For priests, I wouldn't do that with deacons. But for priests, never do for a young man what he can do for himself. And you say, what can a priest do? He can do almost everything. Except you know, drive the van or the car to the super activity, use the credit card to buy things. They can do virtually anything if we let them. Too often we do it for them. Recognition. The I is the ideals. Again, we did it tonight. There's the venturing sign and salute. There's the venturing oath, which we, we did. Group activities. High venture. And I emphasize with high venture, it doesn't have to be dangerous. It needs to be challenging. You need to know the difference. The brother are very concerned about Increasing accidents. I noticed back here my handout, unauthorized list. I was silently applauding. If every LDS brother memorized those list of unauthorized activities, we would have fewer fatalities, guaranteed. In 2007, we had eight fatalities in the BSA that year. Now, sounds awful, but out of three million kids, that's not too bad. Five of the eight were LDS, and that's from 18% of the population. It doesn't add up. So the people in, in Dallas say, why? Why are the Mormons outperforming us when it comes to killing kids? That that even that didn't sound pretty good. I'm sorry. Why why are the Mormons why Mormons have more accidents than we do? What's the answer? We're not reading and following the guideline. We're shooting from the hip. We're saying, well, that's the way I did as a kid. We're running off and doing things we shouldn't. Uh, and each one of these is a tragedy. Most of which could have been averted. Okay, the T is teaching others. Boy, how important is this going to be? For venturing 16, 17 year olds to learn to teach others, when they turn 18, 19, they can go out and teach others. And so throughout the entire venturing program, at every level, it says take what you've learned and make a PowerPoint presentation or table tabletop presentation and teach it to others. When you teach something, you become converted to the principal. And when you, you get the laurels together with the young man, attendance increases, uh, you, you're teaching their Cub Scouts, Relief Society, whatever it is. They go someplace, they come back, and they teach what they want. So this is the methodology of venture. Okay, open up your uh, your packets. You should have the LDS venturing packet. Venturing guide. I, I created this when I was working at the National Office for Venturing. Um, only because I was visiting all these places and I would find a good idea from somebody and they, they didn't give me permission to use it. And so this is just using good ideas from people around the country. First of all is the adventuring methods. I hope that, that tonight you can recite the aims of scouting. What are they? This is to character and fitness. And that, that's not just three nice words, but things that you should think about every time you organize an activity. And then what are Elder Bednar's two questions? Yeah. What are we doing to strengthen the family? What are we doing to bring the young man closer to Christ? Those two things we should ask every time we organize an activity. 
So these seven methods are simply strategies. By the way, what's what's not here that you see over here? Advancement, recognition, symbol. There's not uniform here. And it didn't take a survey to figure that one out. <laughs> that young men at that age, generally speaking, are not enamored with the uniform. So we have the class A that's available, but it says in the book, the uniform, if any, is the choice of the crew. So don't think of yourself as less than a venture crew advisor, you boys aren't interested in you. Maybe they pick a polo shirt, or they pick a, a golf shirt of their own make, or they, or they have, but not, not no shirt, we want them to wear a shirt, but I mean, they don't pick a uniform. That's fine. They're not less Boy Scouts. So the methods. Uh, this sheet I call the uh, Elder Pace sheet. When I was working at the national office, Elder Pace, as some of you may have met, Glenn Pace, was at the time assigned to Africa. He came back to the United States and was quickly put into the Young Men's General Presidency with President Hammond. And I was at a national meeting where he was there and he found out who he found out who it was, and he was really excited. He said, Brother Harris, I'm supposed to teach venturing and film on this. I don't have a clue what venturing is. And, and I have elder in front of my name, and people who expect me to know what's going on. Can you can you give me a brief overview of venturing? And so I said, Yeah, come come back to my office. We went to back to my office, and I was all excited. You know, I had elder pace as my student, and I was gonna be the teacher. And, stood up and had a board in my office and I was going over all this stuff and I noticed after about 15 minutes he started to fall asleep on me. Oh, pace, what's going on? And finally he, he raised his hand and he said, I don't mean to be disrespectful, Brother Harris, but is venturing this difficult? Is, is it this long? Does it take this long to train or can I just get kind of a quick version? It's like the liking. So I created this sheet. called it my other page sheet. It's written in layman's terms. Essentially, venturing is no more or less than resources, a combination of resources for you as tools, as a tool master to help bring young men to Christ at this age. So, real quickly, there's access to national and local camping facilities, and we should go camping as often as we can with these young men. This week, this Saturday, we're going to go and do a bike trip on Saturday. So on Wednesday night, last night, we're over at, at uh, one of my boys' houses because he's a bike expert getting my bike fixed. He's teaching me how to fix my bike. I, I just ride it. I don't know how to fix it. I've never really spent much time. I mean, other than the basic stuff. And so Saturday, we're all going to go out and do a major bike hike with these priests. And what are we going to accomplish? We're going to accomplish a lot. We're going to we're going to have a prayer. We're going to have a reflection afterwards. You remind me to mention that before we go. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get, get close together as a quorum, quorum identity, and we'll be away from gadgetry for three hours. It, it accomplishes all kinds of things. We won't be texting each other because we have our hands on the on both steering wheel, right? Okay, expertise and program helps. There's a book called the Ranger Guidebook, Venturing Leader Manual. I didn't bring them with me. Does anybody have those with them? Wonderful. We can show these. Uh, Van, if you want to help me out here. Yeah, here we go. Oh, perfect. Look. Okay. So this is the, just probably just this one. It's a venturer handbook. You flip it over, ranger handbook. Isn't that cool? We were the first division to put the spine binding, so when you open it up, it stays open instead of the old merit badge books that go apart. So this book is chock full of, of, of very challenging outdoor things. It has, has like 28 outdoor disciplines, 25. The Venture Leader Manual, you have one of those? No. Okay. The, van, the manual, uh, go get one, brother. Take the shrink wrap off. We don't have a good and, and use it. The, the brethren expect us, they, they've delegated to scouting to train us on how to work with our youth. They expect us to go down to the scout shop to get the book, the manual for our calling and to read it. But historically, we don't do well with that as men. Now, when, when was the last time I went to Deseret Book? I rest my case. Who is Deseret Book made for? For the women, right? I mean, what happened during priesthood meeting? They had a special women's night at Jesuit book, and, and everything is, is, is for women because they read. When I wrote the book that, that you talked about, the first draft was approved. The second draft said, Brother Harris, this won't sell because you didn't write it for the women. Because men don't read books, is what Jesuit book told me. So I had to go back and change everything to put sisters and moms, and which is important. So 
we have a bad reputation that they think that we never don't read books. I promise you, if you take the manual and you more than flip through it and you look through the Ranger book for ideas, then you look at the Venture Leader Manual, which has 124 meeting <coughs> plans, 14 super activity suggestions. There's all these awards, which we're not going to talk about tonight, which you can find out about. Bronze, Gold, Silver, Ranger, so on. There's nationally recognized awards for adults, five-hour training, which includes youth protection, the Youth Leadership Skills Course, which is now called Introduction to Leadership Skills for Crew, something you do as a crew and teach the boys leadership in the crew. It's called the ILSP. ILSC? Yeah. ILSC. And then inside the Venture Leader Manual, there's really cool things called ethical controversies. This was made by some people up in the University of Minnesota. So they take a a subject that is controversial, and they give you both sides. And on a, on a night, you pass out both sides, and, and, and they prepare a debate and that's appropriate for tonight, right? The boys debate each other, and you teach them. You can you can attack their ideas, but you don't attack the person. And then you really you don't tell them this in advance. Then you flip, and the boy has to defend a position that he may not personally be you know, really four. So what this teaches boys is empathy. Too many of our young men are kind of kind of really opinionated they learn from their parents. And they get way over and they and they say things and they, they put their feet in their mouth and they, they get in trouble. If they can just have empathy for the other side, it's very helpful. Though the kids love to do those. Uh, there's a module on the parliamentary procedure. You can see the list there. Guide to safe scouting, I mentioned that. And each form should have the venture ranger handbook. They should have the introduction to the leadership skills for crews and the venture leader man. It says break down and buy. Get your word note for you. Okay, now we talked about these these surveys. Steve had a strong testimony of that. This is very simple. You can illustrate how this works. Page four and five. I've done this now three times, uh, once in Texas and twice here. It works every time. I get the boys to do it. So essentially, page four is you make copies of this, and with and how we did it, with permission from the bishop, young men's president, I mean, from your Relief Society and your elders, form, we handed these out to everybody during the opening exercise of priesthood meeting and Relief Society with little pencils. We took 10 minutes and we filled it out. So the boys did it. And so we came back with a, a couple hundred of these completed. Let me show you just quickly what's on here. This is just a form. It says at the top, each year the priests and our venturing crew ask adults to help them create an exciting balanced program. We would like to know in which areas of interest, hobbies, or contacts you'd be willing to help. You're not signing up to be a leader in venturing. You're making us aware of special skills and talents you have that might assist us in creating a fun, great program. We may never use your skills, but we're creating a, a big list. I, I'll take a circle. This is the skills that we identified from our war. Then you have the boys fill this out. And I changed this from the national ones. I want to have young women on here. So I want this to be the first thing, activities with young women. Most men, most young men will check that box. They want to have activities with young women. It's, just, it's a, it's a no-brainer, right? And so you, you get all these, you collect them, and you find out what the most exciting, what, what, what the most common ones are. Here's what the boys want to do. There's some things that you don't have resources for. They have skills that boys don't want to do. Here's the sweet spot. Activities that boys want to do and you have resources to do. And then the boy becomes, as you were mentioning earlier, the boy becomes the activity chair. <coughs> Let's say, John, you really wanted to do scuba. Johnny is the activity chair. And you put him with a consultant, somebody that you found you got from here, who's a scuba certified person, not one-on-one, -on -one, but on the phone or during crew night, they talk and they plan out the activities. So when you have your pregnancy meeting, the week before of this, Johnny would report to the pregnancy how the scuba activities go. By the way, I know scuba sounds out of your league. How many of you involved in scuba at all? Okay, Discover Scuba is inexpensive. Uh, I teach a class at BYU called High Venture Leadership. And we just went last week. I take 20 B BYU students who signed for the class to the Springville pool at 9 o'clock. It's 15 bucks. And we're in there for three hours. And the kids tell me on the evaluations afterward, 
That's the most fun thing they've done at BYU in four years, was spend three hours in a pool school, because most of them have never done school before. This isn't getting certified. It's simply discover school. Now, some crews go and get certified. If you find consultants or people that have skill sets in the ward of the state, you can save money, you can do things for little cost or free, that otherwise you have to pay retail. Activity, chair then is the boy who would be in charge of those activities. So that's how these work. You get them all done in one week, you sit down with your presidency, and then you create your program based on what they put on here. So if you turn to page six, the six is just a simple agenda, an <coughs> annual planning retreat. It's best if you're out of comfortable circumstances here, you're in, you're in a cabin, somewhere away from electronics, away from the chapel. Maybe a house is okay. You get either the whole crew or just your pregnancy, and you take all the results of these surveys and you plot them down on the calendar. Our theme for this month will be mountain men. Our theme for this month will be scuba. Not something you made up, something the boys said they wanted to do, and you have resources to support it. So you don't have to be the expert outdoorsman to be a crew advisor. You have to be a facilitator. Here, here's example A right here. If all we did in my crew was what I'm an expert at, it would be biking and canoeing. And after about three months, kids would get tired of that, they wouldn't come to mutual anymore. So, so we do scuba, we do high venture stuff, we do stuff that, high rope stuff that kids, that I don't have a skill set to do that other people do. So then pages seven and eight is a sample annual plan. Back while we're at it here, we do a quick diversion. I've learned, and there's an annual plan in here too, but this is our form. We have, this is one of those tidbits that I've learned, okay? There's, the, the handbook of instruction says two assistants. It doesn't say first and second assistant. You can do that if you want. We have a program assistant and an administrative assistant based on the vice president and the venture. So our program assistant, we give them this little book. It has this title in front. Here's the core meeting agendas, <coughs> pregnancy meeting agenda. It took, me, it took me five minutes to make this up. You can do the same thing. Uh, here's our calendar from January through September with all the activity chairs and who's in charge. That's a similar calendar. Here's the combined activities with the young women. And then here's the, here's the young women's activities. So we give one of these to the two assistants and the secretary. We tell them to bring it to church and to have the agenda prepared in advance. It works. Uh, our two current assistants for the last six weeks, as they could call, they brought this to church every week. They conduct without me saying anything in court. They, 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 I had, we had to train them that. They didn't just do this, we had to train them. They conduct the meeting. The adults don't speak in the meeting unless we're asked to talk. Or sometimes you, know, you have to interfere. But uh, we, we rotate teaching the lessons. We'll just pass this around. You can look at just a sample of how we do that in our program. Okay, so you have the sample plan. They're on page uh, seven and eight. We have the items that are dark, bold items, or adventuring activities mixed in with other things. You see a theme there. So let's go to page nine. How do we define success? How do we know when a young man's come to Christ? How do we know if a man is a young man is ready to go? I mean, these are tough things. So I'm just simply going to summate what we're talking about. In my view, success is not number of badges and awards we've earned. That, that's, that's the icing on the cake, if, if at all, at this age group. It's not how many Eagle Scouts we have. It's these things. We've completed the activity and survey. <coughs> you can do that this Sunday. Check the box. The adults have completed the program capability inventory. That was what pages four and five. We have a draft annual calendar and a working three-month calendar, which includes activities chosen by the young men and utilizes consultants from the ward. Some awards go on to the state level so they can find a more broad list of consultants. Or they'll have a state pool of people, kind of like a mayor bachelor's. Of Mutual activities are led by youth activity chairs. Uh, Jake, who's not in our presidency, is our activity chair for this Saturday's activity, because he's our bike guy. He's the one who, who recommended it. He's the one who fixes bikes. He's on the Tippinogas bicycle, bicycle team. So he's, he's excited. <coughs> and he's, we're, we're, we're gonna go and have Jake teach us some things. Um, young men have opportunities to teach others, which is one of our methodologies. The introduction to leadership skills for crews has been conducted by the youth. 
the Corps and Presidency has defined duties and meets as needed to plan and administer the program. Let me just share with you one thing that we do. It's not listed here. We make up a sheet like this that has the bishop, young men's president, the assistant advisor, the two assistants, and the secretary. And then what's their duties? And we make that up in a quorum meeting, in a presidency meeting. So one guy's over activation, one's the priest, the sacrament coordinator, one's over the senior sisters, home teaching, you make it up. The key is, if everybody has that, you have defined duties, things work better. Otherwise, if you're a second counselor in a quorum presidency, you don't do anything. Unless the president and first counselor are on vacation. This is what happens in most of them. Is you have no defined duty. You're there as a backup. And by the time a boy's a priest, if that's all they've done as a deacon and teacher, leadership's almost a, almost a joke. Unless you're the president. Second counselor has to have defined duties that he is responsible for. And that's true of bishoprics and state presidencies and so on. So, if you do those simple things, as we've already heard tonight from Steve, your mutual night attendance will increase. Because boys will feel engaged. They'll have their skin in the game. They're ready to go. Attendance at core meetings on Sunday will increase. Your core immunity will improve. Your young men will feel empowered to take ownership. And if those things exist, true success, young men will be drawn closer to Christ because you'll have activities that reflect that. Young men are worthy to make and keep sacred covenants. And that's quicker now than it was a week ago. And young men have committed to serve a full-time mission. Now let me share with you, so the last sheet is how to get started. In the introduction to leadership skills, it tells you how to do a reflection. So I'll just teach you this in closing. A reflection is simply taking time after you've done something to process what you've done. And you try to get a spiritual sense of what you get each time. In the military, it's called an after action review, I believe. It's a similar thing. But here we try to do a spiritual thing. So here's the rules of a reflection. You have to do it right after the event. So if it's a mutual night, before you go home, you reflect. If it's a camp out or a hike, uh, last Wednesday night we did reflections in the pool with our scuba gear. We did this with BYU students. We're all standing with our scuba gear on, conducting reflection. We don't wait till afterwards. It's got to be fresh. You, you make sure you ask open-ended questions. So it's not just yes, no answers. So boys can actually talk. And you have to set... Uh, no, no put downs and no cut downs. That anybody's free to say whatever they want without verbal or non-verbal disapproval. So you set those rules. Okay. So quick story: the same class that I teach at BYU, we do canoeing, Provo River, where it goes into the Utah Lake. Uh, some afternoons, the wind comes up. Uh, that lake, it's it's almost like the ocean out there. I mean, it's big waves. The canoe is kind of scary. So out there one time with the with the uh, kids from the from BYU, about 20 of them. And it was, the wind was blowing us up to Lehigh. We wanted to get back home. And so we had to send some, some stronger strokers up there to help out. We finally got inside the jetty. And I knew we were going to do reflections. So I was, I was focused in on that. But I was in the canoe by myself, which I prefer to do in the back. I know where I'm, I know where I'm going. And the wind was in my face. The waves were coming at me. And I'm stroking hard, looking at this tree on the bank that I knew was my goal. We finally got there. We reflected. What's the first rule of reflection? Immediately. Okay. So we're standing there still wet, life jackets on, canoe paddles in our hand, everybody's safe. Uh, Philmont calls it roses, buds, and thorns. What went well? What could we have done better? What did we learn? And what Philmont does that to kind of open things up. So we kind of did that. What did we learn from this? Get everybody talking. And said, so now let's see if we can draw some spiritual stuff from this. And again, you don't know where this is going. You're just a facilitator. I said, the wind and the waves in your face, trying to make it to that tree on the, on the bank. What might the wind and waves be? And somebody said, well, that's the temptations of Satan. What might the tree represent? Well, the tree could be the priesthood or Jesus Christ. Yeah. Then I had no, no clue where this was going. I said, I noticed if I, re if I really stroked hard, like I learned in Canoe America, instead of the little wimpy stuff, I made progress. If I didn't, the wind and waves would blow me back. What might the strong strokes represent? And one young lady said, Brother Harris. That's daily scripture study and prayer. Wow. Cool. I didn't thought of that. So these young people left this fun canoeing activity thinking that was fun, that was hard. You remember to read my scriptures. Say my prayers. You're focused on Christ and the priesthood. Stay away from the temptations of Satan. Now wouldn't it be nice if your moms and dads 
can rest assured that when little Johnny goes off to venturing, every time he comes back, they know that he's closer to Christ, and he has a stronger in his family because they've conducted a reflection. Some reflections are better than others. You do it a few times, you teach the young men how to do it. And that's where you'll have your richest, most wonderful experiences in the outdoors and on mutual aid is when the young men conduct reflection to young men. It's a wonderful experience. We want our young men to feel the spirit, not just at church. In fact, I think it's easier in the outdoors than it is at church in some cases. We have to sometimes tune in our antenna for that. And before you go into camp out, you should ask moms, what can I do to help your son come closer to Christ on this camp? <clears throat> And moms should be able to call their leader and say, what's going to happen on this campout that's going to help my young men become closer to Christ? That's why we're in business. Bringing young men to Christ so they will make and keep sacred covenants. Reflection is, is just a tool. The venturing program is a tool. Scouting is a tool. We have the For the Strength of Youth. We have Preach My Gospel. We have Duty to God. Seminary, parents, scriptures, lots of tools. Scouting is there to help bring it all together. Say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Um, I was asked ahead of time if, we, if you wanted to, if, if, I, if I could be a helpful uh, questions and answers or anything that we talked about. Success stories. Yes? I'm just going to say one thing. If you haven't read your book, I know you probably wouldn't want to plug your book, but <laughs> all the stuff that he covered is in that book, and the book is great. Our bishop had all of the uh, young men leaders should be hit, and we're doing a reflection, we're doing taking a lot of pieces yeah. from it and it's really changing. Chapter 9 is reflection. Yeah. But enough of that. <laughs> so really, you know, the audit, I mean, we just kind of passed it around. We didn't buy them all because, you know, we didn't want to send it into retirement. Or <laughs> it's been no, a great it's trail, trail to test. It's called trail to test. And it is excellent. Some other things. Other than the book. <laughs> Things, uh, little aha, little hallelujahs you may have had today. Things you need to do differently. Well, I've got a question. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to find good, good uh, leadership and training that we can give to the boys. Okay. Not uh, extremely structured, but something. You know, some of us are good at it, some of us aren't. So I also went mentoring leadership skills course. Well, that's been changed to the ILSC, ILSC, LSC. which is the Introduction to Leadership <coughs> Skills for Recruits. Now, I was the author of the VLSC, and so that five years later they changed it, so I'm not familiar with the new one. But I do have the VLSC in uh, electronic. In fact, that's what we teach our class with the BYU. They don't know what it's Boy Scout training session. Now it's ILSC? ILSC. Which is a way to train, train the boys to be leaders. Okay, and my guess is, I know this is mentioned, but my guess is it has its equivalent for the other. Varsity Boy Scouts. And then Kodiak, let's talk about Kodiak. Do they still have Kodiak? Kodiak, uh, we're in the process of the council of, uh, we're, we're not going to try to provide that on a council level. We're going to teach districts and crews how to conduct their own. Kodiak's kind of step up from the ILSC. Once you've gone through the ILSC, you have to go to ILSC before you can do Kodiak. And Powderhorn is a training for adults. And for youth now. Yeah. And uh, we had a successful one this past summer. Uh, we had uh, 84 boys and their leaders come up uh, for our Powderhorn course, which will be in August again coming here, which uh, will give you also resources to consultants for high adventure, but also give you an, an, an introduction for an opportunity for you youth if they haven't ever really done that. And one of the things that Brother Harrison Bruce probably can tell you that as well. The most, the most popular activity we did at Power Home was the school. Anything related to water. That is absolutely love it. Gets boys' attention. And it's now, great. We held it at Camp Trace this year. I have to travel very far. For everybody been there, can you tell us your name and your phone number? Because he works on the Council Venturing Committee. Yeah, it's uh, John, J O N, Sergeant, S A R. Okay, and your contact? 231. 231? 6992. 6992, okay. Resource. Yes. Add to that, I think all too often when we consider a high adventure component with venturing or even varsity scouting, we think that it's going to involve a lot of money. One thing I've learned working with the council, being involved in several powder horn courses, even winter powder horn courses, 
is that if you've successfully networked with these companies locally like Sport Chalet, uh, different, uh, we even have caving growers <coughs> that are anxious to work with us. Uh, when I went to one of the outdoor retailer shows about a year and a half ago, in full uniform, I thought I was going to be screamed at and yelled at. And then I began to realize that most of the outfitters and a lot of these people that have invented new tent technologies, boat technologies, Kevlar canoes, founders of these companies, Eagle Scouts. They love the boys. They want to help us, and it's not going to involve money. Yeah. Another resource for everybody is please come to Scout Around. It's not about Cub Scouts only if you want. Okay. We have a huge area for venturing scout to plan for this coming scout around this coming year. Uh, when is this scout around? When is it? The other day? So it's May. May. It's like it's May. It's like May. It's like May. First Saturday. First Saturday. 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 Okay. Yep. Okay. You have some great camps. And may I be so bold as to offer a camp in my council? We took our crew to two years ago called Camp and Trotta. It's 10 miles from Moab. And what I liked about Entrada was. Well, I'd, I'd rather go to a scout camp rather than what, what they call hobo camps, where we do it ourselves. It's safer, <laughs> and, and statistically, it's better off. So here, they, they gave us a choice of, and, and you pay more for each one. It was white water rafting on the Colorado River. It was uh, repelling down 200-foot sheer cliffs. They didn't choose that one. It was serious mountain biking on slick rock, and it was shooting, which includes pistols, adventure so we told the boys that our budget says we can do two of the four, and we voted, and surprisingly, the boys came out. We had some four, three, two, one scoring system. They came out with shooting and biking. So all the bikes were provided, all the repairs, all the guns. We showed up, pitched our tents, all the food was provided. We didn't cook anything. We had some great experiences. Uh, Rainbow Bridge, uh, shooting. I mean, kids could do it all day long, and the biking was was not overly difficult, but difficult enough that we had enough to talk about when we got home. And we had the most spiritual experience I've ever had in the outdoors on Thursday night. None of our gadgetry worked because we were out in the boonies. So we sang songs. We invited a couple of the girls and the staff over to introduce them to us. We sat around and we asked the young ladies, what are you looking for in a missionary? Oh, my goodness. And these boys were just like all ears as the girls would talk. And then we sat there and sang uh, Tabernacle Choir songs for the next two hours. Tears rolling down our cheek, looking at the stars, the Milky Way. We'll never forget that. You can do that at any camp. I just mentioned the truck. One small yeah. thing uh, with uh, adventuring, too, uh, at Powderhorn, we had two young ladies join us who were LDS. We don't sponsor young ladies in the adventuring. But they, they wanted to come so bad. Uh, we got them sponsored into a community unit so they could come. And they are st they're, they're going around the council for us right now and enlisting a young woman that you'll never have as much fun. Mm -hmm. You'll find out there's a lot of our young sisters that like to go biking and camp oh, yeah. and guns, and, and uh, you'll find out they'll be one of your greatest resources. Uh, another asset for the overage scouting uh, is, uh, I'm sure National Parks has it, most councils, I want to call high adventure bases. These aren't, these aren't week long courses. It sounds like that's what in front of us. Uh, Teton High Adventure Base. I, I, I've been to Teton High Adventure Base. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, and so you have this variety. The thing I want to stress is that those high, high adventure base staffs are there to work with you to make a customized course, like you were alluding to. They four pick day, the course days, they want to do. Four day. You decide, and then they tailor make the thing for you. It's yeah, it can be three days, two nights, whatever you want. View them as an outfitter more as a, than a camp. They're more of an outfitter. I know there was half time, so um, yes. Have you ever seen any numbers that talk about percentages of crews that actually wear a uniform? It's the official uniform versus of their own choice, a, a t-shirt or whatever, versus no uniform at all? I haven't seen statistics, but I'm guessing uh, less than 10%. With the official uniform, oh, yeah, maybe ten percent with the uniform of their own choosing. No, no, no probably, about, probably forty percent with the uniform of their own choosing. And what about a breakdown of uh, crews that are actually pursuing the rank advances, the awards of venture scouting, versus those who just do the activities? Less you know, than ten percent. Ten percent. That was mostly possible. because they don't know about it. And, and and just a quick thing that I've learned the hard way there. I'm using my brain. I've tried this three places. 
we train people, they go back the next day in priest quorum and they're all excited and they stand in front of the boys and they say, guys, there's a new program called venturing. And the kid just got his eagle, right? Just got his key so he can drive the car. And he's saying, don't tell mom, no, 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 I don't know about this thing. And they talk about this new award called the Ranger Award. It was really exciting. No, don't do that. The kids will just throw you out like John the Baptist and you'll never get in there again. <laughs> so you have this sub, you go, one of your boys is kind of your teammate by himself. And you just very apologetically bring up this book and say, you know, Josh, I was at the scout office last week and I picked up this book, which I think is for boys, you're 50, I think it's for boys your age. Would you do me the favor of looking through here by next week and tell me if there's anything in here at all we can do? And he'll come back next week and of course he doesn't want to appear to be excited either, right? Because he's Josh and he's 17, he's really cool. And he'll say, well, Brother Harris, it has scuba in here. We've never done scuba. No. You think we can do that as a crew? Yeah, let's do that. And it has, it has mountain biking here. It, it has snowmobiling in here. Oh, it has water, water safety stuff. Can we do that? Yeah. How about we get together with some of the guys and we'll just put some of these up on the board. And, and to me, I don't care if you're on the ranger board, but you're going to do some resources in here that will help you draw it closer together to crew. So use the subtle approach. It works much better. Thanks for letting me use the book. OK? Another comment. Yes. I, I've noticed that it's hard to get parent buy-in to any of the award advancements in, in varsity or venture scouting. And I think approaching them like this is a great way to do it, just because uh, once the parents get their boy through the Eagle Scout, it's this huge sigh of relief. Right. And they're saying, let's just have the boy do things now to prepare him for his mission. And we're not going to do anything that leads him to another advancement that doesn't mean anything to the boy or to the parent. So, so I'm glad and what I've learned that, that, that gets parent buy-in is when they say, we're going to help bring your young man to Christ. Yeah. And be a stronger member of your family. And we need your help. And we, we, we need to get into mutual. Yeah. We promise that when we have it mutual, it's not going to be just fun and games. It's going to be strategic. He's going to come back different. Yeah. If you promise to encourage him to come. There's too many parents who are out in La La Land as far as mutual. They just they don't see it as important at all. They don't make the connection. Because we haven't made the connection. It's just fun and games. You can't do that anymore. Especially now. Quick question, how much was it in the crowd and what did it cost? Um, was it 140 or something? For, for, we spent three days, two nights. Something like that, 140, 160. That may sound like a lot of money, but a lot of these high venture bases are using federal lands, yes. national parks. There's some pretty hefty fees that you'd have to be paying if you went with just a regular guide service. I'm yeah. seeing some heads not in here. By the way, our boys raised the money to go. It wasn't mom and dad's. The boys raised the money to go. So they had ownership. They wanted to go. And they, they raised the money to go. It wasn't the last minute decision. Oh, the, the church will take care of it. Okay.